Yes, I think so. Um, so first of all, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers and in particular Unter for the invitation. Um, it's uh, my first online talk in Taiwan. And I was not aware, um, but yes, of course, Happy New Year to everybody. Now, this will be a very um, severe change of gears and of topics talking about nuclear transitions for quantum control and metrology. Um, and the story starts um, by remarking that we are very used to quantum dynamics with atoms and you know having coherent light sources in the optical or infrared regime, which are based on atomic transitions um, of valence electrons, and then have those light sources to control um, other atomic systems or molecular systems. So this is something we are very much used to, but this is typically something about optical or infrared light coherently interacted with atoms. But what about now not atomic transitions, but nuclear transitions? What about nuclear quantum dynamics? Now, of course, if we think about nuclear transitions, we have energies which are no longer in the optical or infrared regime. We are talking now about X-rays or about, as you'll see, vacuum ultraviolet would be the lowest energy and the lowest um, lying nuclear excited state that we are aware of. And the question is whether using nuclear quantum dynamics, we can reach something new and interesting, and maybe we can revolutionize nuclear physics applications, or as you'll see, X-ray control applications, or maybe a nuclear clock in a similar manner that the appearance of a laser of a laser has revolutionized atomic physics technology and also metrology. So this would be, so to say, the goal. And um, there are two incentives, maybe in two directions. One of them is to use such transitions to control light. Um, and there I would like to introduce to you the incentives for X-ray quantum control. So X-rays are photons. They just carry high energy and high angular momentum. So have a much shorter wavelength than optical photons. And they are very robust and they can be also very efficiently detected. They penetrate very well through material and they can also be focused very well. And actually I am, uh, <laughs> it's a nice opportunity now to present this plot, which originally came from Unter in the time he was in Heidelberg, which is something to show you uh, an example about focusing. Because if you try to focus light, you're typically limited by the diffraction. Yeah? So you cannot focus on spots much smaller than the wavelength of light. This means that if you want to address an atom matrix with an optical laser, then you are typically addressing with something like 800 nanometers optical focus, and you are talking to many atoms at the same time, which can be something good if this is what you want. But in the other hand, on the other hand, you cannot speak with individual atoms properly if they are all together. Um, so with X-rays, because their diffraction limit comes at an angstrom or less, you can in principle focus on the size of an atom and address like individual atoms. And this would mean that we can reach ultimate miniaturization for photonic circuits, also sensing with unprecedented spatial resolution. And these incentives have also been encouraged by the fact that in the last 10, 11 years, we had the first strong, very intense X-ray sources, the X-ray free electron laser, the first of them, um, started operating in, in Stanford in the United States in 2009 and in Japan um, in 2011. But by now, actually, even in Germany, the European X-ray free electron laser war is operational in Hamburg um, now for already three or four years. Now, the other incentive that is kind of interesting and would be the second part of my talk is what uh, Unda has mentioned, the fact that um, we might use very um, special nuclear transitions to build a frequency standard. So to build basically a clock. We all know that the second is defined based on a hyperfine transition of the 6S electro electron in the cesium atom. Um, and this gives us 10 to minus 16 frequency uncertainty. Now, there is a nuclear transition, which is in principle reachable with vacuum ultraviolet narrowband lasers, and which could be used 
uh, instead of the 6x transition in the cesium atom, it could be the nuclear transition in the isotope thorium-229. Um, I'll come back to it later with more details, but the fact that the ratio between the width of this transition and the energy of this transition is 10 to minus 20 um, tells us that this can be a much better frequency standard than the cesium is, although allegedly the cesium clock is no longer the most precise clock that we have, but they still define the second with the cesium clock. Yeah. In addition to that, because you know you have a nuclear transition and the nucleus is always well surrounded by electrons and well isolated, we believe it would be less sensitive to systematic frequency shifts. Yeah, um, it would be a, in this respect a better frequency standard. And on top of that, we could ask questions to physics that maybe we shouldn't ask. For instance, we can probe with this nuclear transition whether fundamental constants are indeed constant in time. And this is a, a very interesting topic. Now, my talk will be structured then in two directions. I'll first like to go towards the idea of X-ray quantum coherent control and use their reverse power transitions, which are in the X-ray regime. You'll see a wavelength of about one angstrom. And I will introduce to you a platform that we use for that, which are the thin film cavities also illustrated here. And I'll give you some examples for our research. And then I will move towards this nuclear frequency standard with thorium-229 and um, tell you a few words about our research and what's the status right now with the um, preparation for developing such a clock. Now, let us start with the first part. So um, I was mentioning something about thin film x-ray cavities. Well, these are not the very uh, high finesse cavities that you are used in um, cavity QED but it's an interesting concept. So the concept is we have here a sandwich of very, very thin layers. All these layers you see over here are just few nanometers thick. And um, we have to begin with a material with a high Z, for instance, platinum or palladium. Um, this would be the darker gray over here. And because of this, the X-ray pulse can come and cup on evanescently, meaning that it basically generates a standing wave inside these layers. Um, then we have the layer which is of interest to us is the layer, the green layer, which has inside a nucleus, which has a Merzbauer transition, um, which means this transition can be, you know, um, excited and excited recoillessly. And this is resonant to the X-ray frequency. So the X-rays are tuned, for instance, if we take the most used most power isotope, iron 57, it has a transition at 14.4 kilo electron volt between the nuclear ground state and the nuclear first excited state. And this corresponds to a wavelength of about one angstrom. Now let's put all our nuclei over here and we want to excite them. And we want to excite them with this cavity field, which appears when the X-ray pulse comes in grazing incidence. So it really comes at very, very small angles. You'll see we are talking here about, if you look at this plot, um, milliradian, yeah? Um, and we generate here a standing wave. And this is what you see over here. So you hear, see here the intensity of the field um, in the blue plot and the white, stripe, white lines are over here showing you where the layers are. Now, the additional material that you see here, the lighter gray is basically a filler. This allows us to position the iron layer where we want it to be in the cavity field. We typically choose for that a low Z material because that doesn't interact with X-rays at all, right? So it's just, you know, it's just there to keep the proper position. And what you detect here, the observable is in reflectance, in reflectivity, the X-ray pulse, which has already interacted here with the cavity and is coming back to the detector. Now, just to give you an example, you see here the reflectivity as a function of the incidence angle, and this is without having the nuclei in. This is basically just the electronic reflection, and you see that you have at certain angles, so-called resonant angles, you have the perfect standing wave inside the cavity. There is no light coupling out. And that's a position which is interesting, for instance, for exciting the nuclei, because then you know all your field is inside the cavity, exactly at this position, yeah? Um, and you know that that field can interact with the nuclei for a longer time. So the nuclear resonances will interact with the cavity field. Um, and you'll see that this actually gives you access to interesting effects of quantum optics. Now, why? What happens here is because we have a cavity field, all um, which is kind of a standing wave, 
all iron nuclei see the field at the same phase, which allows them to interact collectively and decay collectively. And this brings me to the concept of superradiance, which means um, this faster, stronger decay of a system due to coherence effects or collective cooperative effects. So all these nuclei basically behave as one. And this system, this type of thin film cavities, was the one where a very beautiful superradiance result has been observed. And this is what I picture here. This is experimental data from one experiment back in 2010. And what you see here is the intensity measured at the detector as a function of time after the excitation. And this is a log scale plot. So spontaneous decay as we know it from you know, incoherent single, uh, single nucleus decaying is over here. Yeah? So the red line up there is actually the spontaneous decay as I know it from the tables, as I would expect you know, from a single nucleus. And what has been observed is an equally straight line for quite a while, much steeper, which has basically in the exponential a factor 42 or a factor 61, these are two different samples, uh, on top of the spontaneous decay. And this is the enhancement factor from the superradiance. And this is really um, showing you that these cavities are very good. Basically, what happens is that the, the, the field manages to excite the uh, radiative eigenmode of the sample, right? And then you really have a superradiant decay, which is, you know, factor 40 or factor 60 faster. And this is actually the control knob that we have over the system. So you can consider that you have a, um, you know, you have a system which has its spontaneous decay. On top of that, it has a superradiant decay, which is much faster, right? Factor 40 is already much faster. And you can control the pair the spontaneous decay, which the, the sorry, you can control the superradiant response. Of course, you cannot control the spontaneous decay. So it means basically you have control over the system because you're controlling the channel, which is the fastest. Now, let me tell you what we have done with this idea. Um, we have called this X-ray ping pong because um, it looks like basically um, that we take a cavity which is more complicated because it has now two iron layers and we are managing to convince the system to exchange many times the X-ray photon um, that is present in the system between the two layers. Yeah? And basically this can happen many times. So the analogy is that we have um, an X-ray pulse. If we are taking a synchrotron radiation X-ray pulse, then typically there is just a single resonant photon per pulse inside. Yeah. And that's basically a single resonant photon coupling with one nuclear ensemble and the second nuclear ensemble. So the ping pong ball is basically our X-ray photon, which is resonant to the nuclei in both layers. And each layer has a rocket, right? And each layer is kind of bouncing back and forth that ball in between. And we would like, so to say, to control the system and request it that this ball remains in the system for a long time. And we will detect this at, in the reflectivity at the detector as usual. Basically what we will see is an oscillation because there has been an oscillation over here in between the two layers. And we kind of, brought here an analogy with a strong coupling regime of cavity QED. In the strong coupling regime, you have a field and the system and the interaction between field and system is larger than the system decay rate. So the field and the system can exchange a photon many times before this photon is lost to the environment. In our case, it's not the same, but we have the same type of Rabi oscillations because the photon is absorbed and re-emitted many times between the two ensembles. And let me show you our theoretical idea first and then also the experimental results. So we can consider the system as a kind of two couple cavities. And the photon typically can be either in the first cavity or in the second cavity, either inside the cavity already absorbed. Um, because these cavities are very lossy, we will typically adiabatically eliminate the cavity modes and then remain with a kind of three level system, which looks in the following manner. So what we can have, we can have an excitation in the first layer, which is over here. Yeah? We can have an excitation in the second layer. The cavity introduces a coupling between these two states. And in case we have lost the photon because it just, you know, it was kicked out, 
um, we have reached the ground state when there is no, no photon left, so to say, in the field, neither in the cavities nor as excitation stored. And these gamma 1 and gamma 2 are basically the um, superradiant decays of the first layer and the second layer. Um, and we additionally have some shifts because typically in superradiance, you not only have the stronger decay, but you also have a small shift, which is called collective lamp shift. Now, how can we control the system such that this omega is larger than the gammas? Because this would be mimicking the strong coupling, right? It turns out that all parameters change with the X-ray incidence angle. So looking at this, let us try to plot then as a function of incidence angle, the three quantities, omega r, gamma one, and gamma two. And if we do so, we see that, and if there is an angle at which the blue curve, like this omega, the coupling between the two excited states is about 10 times stronger than the decay rates, which are over here. So in principle, if we are making an taking a shot with the experiment at this angle, we should be able to see the Rabi oscillations because of this photon being absorbed and re-emitted many times. And this being said, let me show you also some experimental results. Um, the experiment was performed um, at Petra at the Hamburg synchrotron in Germany by the group of Ralf Rellsberger. And indeed, so in energy, what you see here, reflectivity is a function of, of property tuning. Instead of thinking a sing single line as we should, we see a split line. And this has to do with this kind of equivalent of va vacuum splitting in cavity QED. And in time, because of the splitting, we see the Rabi oscillations. Now, so this is basically the energy response and this is the time response of the sample. So indeed, the resonance is split and we could observe these Rabi oscillations, confirming that we could keep that X-ray photon to play ping pong yeah, uh, in between the two layers. And we are, of course, very lucky that this made it on the cover of Nature Photonics um, and made some publicity for quantum optics with X-rays, which is, of course, just an emerging field. So we could benefit of that. Now, as you see, um, interesting effects can happen in more complicated cavities, right? I mean, this story was now with a cavity with two iron layers. Um, and it turns out that it's increasingly difficult to treat theoretically and, and you know, put a model together to see what is the reflectivity um, for more and more complicated structures. And this is why uh, we realized that before going to more control of X-ray photons, we would need to develop um, a formalism to deal with this. And this is what we've done. I think this is the only slide with a lot of formulas. And I hope you'll forgive me for that. What I wanted to tell you is that we have just recently um, developed a green function formalism, which can treat layered systems, you name them how complicated. For instance, this is a theoretical result from a, 30, a cavity with 30 layers, 30 resonant layers, and of course, many other layers in between. And this model can treat it, can be used in principle for any multi-layer structure. We have compared um, this, the results of our quantum green function formalism model with semi-classical models from the layered formalism, and we see that we obtain perfect agreement. So that's really cool. But in addition, because we treat the full quantized electromagnetic field, we will also be able to address, for instance, quantum aspects of the scattered light. Yeah. And in principle, yeah, I put the formulas in, but we obtain the green function. This is a kind of quasi 1D green function, because in these cavities, you have translational symmetry you know, in the plane, and you're just interested in the depth, so to say, uh, where the layer stacks are. And then you can obtain from there, so to say, the equivalent of the uh, lamp collective lamp shift and of the super radiant decay um, in, in the Hamiltonian in the, in the, in the Lindblad operator. And this definitely is, um, without going into further details, the fact that it can be used for any layer structure and that it's qu full quantum with quantized field and it's versatile and in principle it doesn't need any you know input parameters so it's, it's almost um, it is in principle not an issue we need still need the density of of nuclei to introduce but otherwise it's a very versatile formulas and we believe this would be a good starting point for further design of schemes that can control x-rays and ultimately to um, produce some design of photonic devices for x-rays. Now, with this um, theory part, so to say, 
let me switch gears and go to the nuclear clock part. And for the nuclear clock, um, I can assure you that at the moment, the storm transition that I'm talking about at about eight electron volt is absolutely unique. If you look here at all kinds of energies of nuclear long lived states, which are called nuclear physics isomers. So nuclear isomer means excited state, which lives a lot, metastable state. Yeah, and if you look here at energy as a function of half-life, you see that everybody is at energies of, you know, mega electron volt, kilo electron volt, hundreds of kilo electron volt. And there are only two which are kind of below 100 electron volt. One of them is uranium, 235 with 76 electron volt, and thorium is with eight electron volt. And, you know, the main advantage eight versus 76 is, of course, you can hope of having a vacuum ultraviolet laser, a narrowband laser, with which you can um, do exactly the type of clock that um, is used from atomic clocks. Yeah? And we again believe that this nuclear transition will be mostly immune to external perturbations. And we could have an ultra precise nuclear frequency standard, and we could go for tests of, of variation of fundamental constants. Um, and finally, just um, to remind myself, because I had not realized for a while, is that thorium, so the name, um, comes from the, the Norwegian god, uh, Scandinavian god, Thor, the thunder god, um, because actually this ore containing thorium was, was uh, discovered in Norway. Okay, now, Interestingly enough, because we have such a very unusual low-lying um, sm small energy for the nuclear transition, it turns out that the coupling to atomic shells is very, very strong. Namely, this eight electron volt is larger than the first ionization potential of the ion. So basically what it means is that this outermost electron of thorium, which has um, many, many electrons, yeah? So we're talking about 90 electrons. Um, the 7s electron, which is the farthest out there, has an ionization potential of 6.3 electron volts. So 8 electron volt is sufficient to kick this electron out. And this process is called internal conversion. So internal conversion happens not only in thorium, happens in several other low-lying, for several other low-lying excited states, namely that the nucleus, instead of emitting a photon to emit, you know, radiatively, and the excite radi radiatively, transfers its energy to an electron from the bound shell, from the electronic shell, which is simply kicked out. And this is called internal conversion. And in the case of thorium, interestingly enough, it only works right with the 7s electron because the next ionization potential is already 12. So that's it. And um, I have to emphasize that the radiative decay of the nuclear transition, so this, like a photon, has never been seen. And we also never managed to excite that nucleus with a photon. So, so far, this principle that would work for the nuclear clock was never seen. What we have seen was always the decay via this internal conversion channel. And this is where I would like to present you a few details. So um, the nature paper that uh, Unter was mentioning was exactly such a measurement. So somebody has tried to measure the energy of this electron and from that to deduce by knowing exactly what the ionization potential, um, what is the trans nuclear transition energy with more precision because um, the value that we knew for 10 years, more or less, after 2007 was that it should be 7.8 electron volt plus minus a half electron volt. And that's actually quite a lot of error, you know, an error bar for uh, afterwards trying to look at this with a laser. So we need a better measurement for the, for the nuclear transition energy. And, in the group of Peter Dillard in Munich, they were taking a uranium source, which produces partially um, thorium in the excited state, in the isomeric state, and it was uh, mass separating it and keeping here ions of thorium two plus and um, thorium three plus. And then here it was kicking these ions out. We just look here at the zoom. And they put inside also a thin film of graphene, which is neutralizing these thoriums. Why? Because you need neutral thorium to be able to have this internal conversion, right? Thorium 2 plus, thorium 3 plus cannot kick out any electrons because the energy is not sufficient. And then afterwards, after neutralization, uh, you need to, to wait for something like microseconds and then an electron can be emitted. 
And this electron was kind of guided here by a magnetic field to enter a magnetic bottle type retarding field spectrometer. And here it was registered at an MCP detector. And in between, we have here a retarding field. So in principle, we should know by knowing the value of retarding field where the electrons still reach the detector, we would know what's the energy of those electrons. Unfortunately, instead of having here, however, a sharp cut, you know, a number of counts as a function of retarding voltage, we see here an interesting structure. And this is where we came into play. So it turns out that unfortunately, during that process of neutralization, you populate excited states, right? So it's no longer so easy to connect the energy of the electron which came out with the energy of the nuclear transition because you have in principle the nuclear transition energy, the ionization potential, but you have for each atom, you could have a specific initial state over here and also in thorium plus in the ion, yeah, after internal conversion, you can also have several final states. So you have here a big mess. And actually we were there to sort out this mess performing atomic um, structure calculations and uh, calculating the internal conversion rates for all of these so that um, one could extract the value of 8.28 plus minus 0.17 electron volt, um, which shows us actually, you know, it's not 7.8. It's unfortunately also not below 7.8 since the lower the energy, the better it would be for the construction of the vacuum ultraviolet uh, laser. But anyway, with this measurement, uh, we made it on the cover of Nature in September 2019, so one and a half years ago. And we were very happy about that. Now, just more recent developments in our group was that since you see that the, the coupling to the atomic shell is so important, we were trying to exploit this also in a different project, a process called electronic bridge. Now, electronic bridge is something which happens when we are in a situation where we cannot perform internal conversion because the energy is not sufficient to ionize a bound electron. And also there is, if you're looking, you know, here are the nuclear levels and on the right are the electronic levels. And this nucleus would like to decay and it would like to transfer its energy to the electron. It cannot kick it out because you see the ionization potential is higher up. And there is no state over here exactly at the nuclear transition energy. So what can happen? Well, in principle, maybe one can go via a virtual state. And this is the process of electronic bridge, meaning um, I don't have a perfect match between nuclear and atomic transitions. So one goes via a virtual state, one has afterwards a photon. Yeah, so in principle, the energy conservation is satisfied by considering the nuclear transition energy, the atomic transition energy, and finally also um, the, um, the photon energy, yeah. And this is the so-called process of electronic bridge. We can consider also the idea now, not that the nucleus is excited and wants to decay, but we can also consider the opposite idea. We can consider a situation in which the electronic shell has some excitation and would transfer this excitation to the nucleus. And it should go in a similar manner, you know, via virtual state and the photon is emitted with the energy conservation. Or, of course, you realize that it doesn't have to be this way. It could also be first the photon and then the nuclear excitation. Right? So, in principle, this virtual state can have two positions. One of them is first, uh, you know, electron goes down to virtual state, nucleus excited, and then a photon, or a photon is emitted, but the electron comes to virtual state, which matches um, the nuclear transition. Okay, so this is, in a nutshell, the idea of electronic bridge. Of course, in perturbation theory, it's going one order further than internal conversion because it requires this additional photon. Nevertheless, it turns out it could still be much better, uh, so much stronger channel than um, direct photo excitation. Because this direct photo excitation is very, very low at the moment. And here I can show you now two examples considering this electronic bridge in thorium ions. And we were performing calculations on an ion which has thorium 35 plus. So it still has many electrons because I told you thorium has 90, but at least um, some of them were lost. And there is an open 4F shell. And it turns out that in the open 4F shell, the plenty of electronic M1 transitions, we need the M1 transitions because 
this nuclear transition is not the electric dipole, but it's magnetic dipole. And I haven't mentioned this so far, but this is the situation. So we have a magnetic dipole tra nuclear transition, and this is why we need some match here between electronic states. And um, our idea was that we can find in this open 4F shell such a situation in which one starts from an excited state, ele excited electronic states. Um, it turns out that if we use an electron beam ion trap, this excited state is in principle populated via collisions and it has a steady state, a kind of 17% population. So there is some population in that state. And then we come with a laser photon, which goes exactly to the virtual state, which corresponds to this energy that can excite the nucleus. And then the electronic bridge can happen, this time stimulated. So I'm coming with a, with a laser photon. The laser photon is um, UV photon. So we have tunable sources and also tunable pretty strong sources in this, in this uh, region. And then we can excite the nucleus. And it turns out that the excitation scheme is several orders of magnitude stronger than direct photo excitation. It does not require a VUV laser, but it requires just the UV laser, which we already have. And it turns out, because we can measure very precisely all other things in the system, so these energies, these energies, and the laser photon energy, we could, if we manage to drive the state, we know at which laser photon energy this happened, we can uh, determine with um, sub milli electron volt precision what's the isomer energy after a one day scanning campaign. And this sounds very very promising and um, also made us a nice paper in physical review letters last year. Now, finally, at the last point, we have a similar idea, but now kind of strange in a completely different system. So not electron bri electronic bridge, but not in highly charged ions at all, but in VMV transparent crystals. So there is this other idea of trying to develop a solid state nuclear clock and dope thorium as much as possible into a crystal which is otherwise transparent, transparent to vacuum ultraviolet radiation. And one of these crystals is calcium fluoride. Now, the fact that we dope uh, thorium inside produces some problems in the crystal because actually calcium has valence two and thorium comes in with valence four. And this is why there is some defect in the crystal. There is additional interstitial fluorine appearing like the green one, see the, the other cubic nice structure is the structure of calcium fluoride. On top comes the thorium dopant. And on top, unfortunately, because of thorium and this difference in valence, we get two additional interstitial fluorines. And then a defect states appear, uh, appears in the conductor in the, in the band gap, which is kind of the equivalent of a, um, an electron of these fluorine interstitials moving to thorium. So it's a defect which is basically also localized on thorium. And we have realized that we can use this defect in an electronic bridge scheme. For instance, if you see it over here, this is the conduction band of the crystal. This is the um, valence band. And we have the defect state. And if we manage to excite first the defect state, this defect state um, theory puts it very close to the nuclear transition energy. And then this could easily go down and excite the nucleus. And this is a scheme which can then be supported like with a laser or just in case, you know, it's just theory that the defect is over here. In case the defect is a bit lower, then one can even come with a laser and drive the scheme. And this idea of now using a defect, which otherwise is annoying to do something with it, um, was also uh, a nice result for last year, how to apply electronic bridge and use the present situation in this vacuum ultraviolet transparent crystals. Okay, and with this, I come to my conclusions. I was telling you about how quantum optics with X-rays can be successful in the symptom cavities, where most importantly, we have collective effects. Yeah? We really have very nice, pure, nice super radiant effects. And we would like to continue in this duration and try to exploit this control further and maybe go towards applications in, in uh, quantum technologies or quantum imaging. And in the second part, I was describing the exciting perspectives and ideas of a nuclear clock at the borderline between nuclear and atomic physics and quantum optics, if you want. So um, if you are experts in VUV lasers and uh, 
you are um, eager to join the field, then anything around 8.2, 8.3 electron volt would be great. Okay, and with this, I would like to thank my group and thank my um, funding and my collaborators at DAISY and in Munich. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Okay. Okay, thank you, Elena. So any questions? Any? Uh, maybe I start for, okay, Rui Guang? Yeah. Hello, yeah, it's Rui Guang speaking. Okay, so thank you for the nice talk. So, uh, so in the, concerning the uh, excitation for the nuclear internal uh, conversion, so what should be the gener generating rate or how long do we need to, to perform the measurement? Um, how long do we need to perform which measurement? The internal conversion, you mean? The measurement of energy? Yes. Yeah. Um, so as far as I remember this experiment, if this is what you're asking, um, they were typically taking like three day slots, but they definitely accumulated many days of measurement mm -hmm. for this because um, at the end again, so the, the internal conversion lifetime is seven microseconds. But of course, you lose many of these, so you don't detect all electrons. And this is why, in order to get a reasonable data set, usually it was three days. Okay, yeah, yeah thank you. So, any questions? Uh, then I have a question. Uh, in, in the electron bridge scheme um, in EBIT, so how to measure the thorium excitation? Um, here. In the EBIT, okay, yes, okay, I'll be EBIT. right there with you. So the idea would be that um, first you can measure with uh, very good precision with laser spectroscopy, you can measure where these levels are, yeah? So you can know exactly what's kind of the, 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 the ground state, okay, you know, but you know, we will know what's the, uh, this 4.19 electron volt. Right now, this value comes from theory. And actually this was this value and the 8.4 value where the major, uh, headaches for theory and Pablo Bilos was working like halfway a year on getting a very good convergence because you have a very complicated electronic scheme. But in the experiment, the idea would be that these would be measured. So you would measure the 8.4, you'd measure the 4.9, and then you would come with a um, tunable you, you ultraviolet laser photon, and you'd also know exactly when that happened. And as you tune, you see you get a big peak in the nuclear excitation as you reach this virtual state. And then basically the position of the peak would tell you, you know the position of the peak, you know what the laser photon was, that's why you would know what the isomeric state was. And this precision of sub milli electron volt comes from the fact that all these in the EBIT, they can perform these measurements of the states and they, we would know the laser with the precision of typically like um, some of them micro electron volt and some of them like um, 10 micro electron volt. Uh, one more question. Um, uh, any new plan in the thorium community? Any new what? Uh, new plan. What's the next new step? Plan? Um, well, I mean, they, you know, they got the synergy grant. We're also involved, although just as an external partner. Um, and of course, there is plenty of money. I think right now, the big, big effort is invested in the VUV source. Um, there are people in Germany working on this. There are people at JLA, Junye, the, the frequency comp uh, master. Yeah, They're working on developing a kind of little bit tunable VUV narrowband source in the region of 8.1, 8.2 electron volt. And I think this is actually, this is the most important part now, because if that works, then finally we can try to excite with a photon the transition. Again, this has never worked so far because the sources are too broad because the, you know, you need to eliminate everything, all other possibilities of decay because the, the photo excitation and the photo decay are <laughs> is the, the weakest channel. Yeah. And uh, I think right now, this is the main problem. And from theory side, of course, uh, there is a lot of uh, effort in the direction of um, 
determining this uh, variation of fundamental constants, looking for dark matter, looking for topological dark matter. I mean, it's really wild stuff going on on theory, but it's a lot of looking for new physics with this transition as well. Uh, any question from online audience? Oh, it seems not the case. Okay, then let's thank Ariana again. Thank you, Ariana. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you.